Welcome back, folks. We are now joined all the way from Boston by a good friend of ours. We interviewed him in Vermont last year about this time. I'll put that into context. He is Dr. Jun Lei Lee, a senior lecturer in early childhood education at Harvard's Graduate School of Education and senior fellow at the Fred Rogers Center for Early Learning and Children's Media. Doctor, good to talk to you. Good morning, Steve. Good morning. We're taping in the morning. You're remote in Boston. I'm over in uh, down here in Jersey. We saw each other in Vermont last year at the Terrell Day, the Terrell Funds Day for Children, talking all about child care, talking also about the great Fred Rogers, talk about PBS, and the importance of love, which he advocated. Question, in the times in which we're living in, we tape on June 24th, how important is love and, and how we love each other during this COVID-19 crisis? I think when I think of love, uh, particularly in the case of young children, uh, whether it is at home or in preschool and childcare, I think of the form in which love takes, right? It's not just something we think we feel or it's not even just something we say. I think love takes the form of the simplest, most ordinary human interactions that happens between two people whether it happens in person or whether it happens over a camera like you and I right now, or whether it happens on a telephone when you call your grandparent who has been in the retirement home and hasn't been able to see any family for the last three months. I think a fundamental question, particularly given the time we're in, not only the global pandemic, but the global protest against racism, is that Every human interaction can be either humanizing or dehumanizing. And we have seen that on television, we have seen it in our own lives. And so love to me at this time means to be able to consciously think about and choose to have human interactions with anybody, whether it's our own families, whether it is a stranger that humanizes that person that sees that person as a human being, as a whole human being, not just by one particular aspect of that person. I think of our daughter who's nine as we're taping this program, and then I say, okay, when she's four or five, millions of children saw this, younger. They see police officers disproportionately white um, beating, apparently, allegedly, beating often too often, African-American men, some women, to death, kneeling on their necks. We try to keep them away from that video. We don't want to traumatize them, but it is real. What the heck is the age-appropriate conversation for the horrific racial injustice going on, often involving white police officers and black and brown men and women? Or do we shield them from it because they just can't handle it? I know it's a loaded question, but I, I know I'm not the only parent who struggles with this. I think I'm also struggling with that question as a parent. I have two, young, uh, two daughters who are teens, who are um, 13 and 17. And the 17-year-old learns about all these things just through her social media. So she brings it to me. Right. So then I think a general rule is if a child at any age brings a question to you, then the child is ready to talk about it. But then on the other side, um, when children, even if they've heard of it, they don't bring it to you. Do we say something? Do we initiate the conversation? I think in the past, I used to think, well, let's just wait until the children bring it up. But I think the events of late reminded me that, no, actually, it's quite a privilege and luxury to not bring it up. I think of how, you know, I have two Chinese daughters, and in the cultural stereotype of tiny little Chinese American girls, they would never be seen as dangerous. And so I never have to bring up with them these issues that have impacted our black communities for so long. But think of 
a black parent of my age who have sent two children, two girls, or two boys. It is not a luxury that they have not to bring it up. And so part of, I think, the reflection that many of us have to gra grapple with is that how do we go outside the privilege and luxury that we feel, even including the conversations we choose to have or not to have, when other families have no choice but to have that conversation. And, and it's not just about racism, because racism is tied so closely to social inequities. In our families, we have had abundance since the pandemic. We, have, we didn't have to worry about food. We didn't have to worry about jobs. We didn't have to worry about money. And so in our family, we started to talk about what it means to not have it. And why is it that people don't have it? whereas we sit comfortably in our house. And again, that's a, a topic that we have to bring up because within the luxury of our own living, it's not a necessary topic. Go back to COVID-19. You and I are able to, we're able to produce this programming remotely. You're able to do your scholarly work often remotely. Sure, you want to be in the classroom. Sure, we want to be in the studio. But when it comes to real childcare issues, we've been able to manage a lot of that because of privilege, because of our situation. So many have not, because they have to be out there. Talk about that. I think there's, early on uh, when the global pandemic hits, I think there's a misconception that people started to talk about COVID-19 as a great equalizer in the sense that it would, you know, whether you're a celebrity or whether you're an average person, you can catch it. But I think what seemed to be much more accurate is that this global pandemic is a magnifier. It magnified the great inequalities that existed um, between regions, between populations, even down the, all the way down to between neighborhoods. That whether or not you catch the virus, how deadly the virus is to you is divided along the lines of race and economic social class. Whether or not you have easy access to testing or to hospitalization is developed between our rural urban communities. It exacerbates so, the divide, including the absolutely. digital divide, which we'll talk about in another interview. Everything's, so it didn't really bring us together and equalize us. It exacerbated the gaps and the divides, no? Absolutely. And, and I think all the way down to, you know, sometimes we look at these big statistics and we're thinking about, oh, how many cases? I'm just taking it to a personal level. Whether a family feels like they are able to cope with homeschooling, with everyone together, and the family feels like they are overwhelmed by having to do it, that is also divided along these same li lines. It has to do everything to do with what kind of wireless and internet access you had at, at home, what kind of physical space that you we have, have at I home. have an office, you have an office. Not right. everyone has a home office. That's right, that's right. And when you and your children all have to share a tiny space and have to share an unstable internet connection, and between three children you have only one device, then all of a sudden the stay at home and learning at home just all of a sudden become completely unfeasible. Doctor, thanks so much. Stay right there, but for everyone else, we'll be right back. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by the Turrell Fund, supporting reimagined child care. PNC, grow up great. The New Jersey Economic Development Authority. RWJ Barnabas Health. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. The Northward Center the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, PSENG, and by the Adler Aphasia Center. Promotional support provided by NorthJersey.com and Local IQ, part of the USA Today Network, and by Jaffe Communications. The essence of the Northward Center is ingrained in our values, thoughts, and actions. What began as a storefront on Bloomfield Avenue has evolved into a life-changing community nonprofit. The mansion is steeped in tradition, but with all of its grandeur, the true essence of the Northward Center is in the people we serve. So as the Northward Center commemorates 50 years of service, 
Let's also celebrate the many opportunities yet to come.